Welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is Cauchy's theorem. Now, the first thing to say, although I hope it will be obvious from my introductory line, is that we are going to be talking about Cauchy's theorem in group theory, not the incredibly important Cauchy's theorem in complex analysis. So if you come to this video looking for a statement and proof of Cauchy's theorem in complex analysis, you're going to be incredibly disappointed. Okay, and you might as well leave now. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Cauchy's theorem in group theory. So what I'm going to do in this video is firstly state Cauchy's theorem in group theory, and then um, prove it. Okay, so let's start with a statement of it. So Cauchy's theorem applies to finite groups. It's a theory about finite groups, and not about infinite groups. So we're going to suppose that we've got some finite group, so I'll write the order of my group, capital G here, is going to be some finite natural number, which I'll call little n here. Okay, now, uh, Cauchy's theorem actually does a similar thing for us that, that as the... Um, Seelov theorems, okay, in particular the first Seelov theorem. Indeed, what Cauchy's theorem tells us is that there will always exist subgroups inside your group of certain orders, okay, and in fact it allows you to conclude that these subgroups are going to be cyclic groups, so it completely characterizes what the structure of these subgroups is going to be. So it's going to be a theorem about subgroups, in particular cyclic subgroups, that always exist inside any group, okay. Right, and of course it's about finite groups rather than infinite groups. So now the next stage is to say, okay, let's say that when we uh, factorize down this order of this group into its prime factorization, which is something we're well aware of how to do for school maths. Okay, we've got some natural number here, we can factorize it down into its prime factorization in terms of positive natural number prime numbers. Okay, let's say that we get some prime appearing in that. So let's say we've got some prime, p here, um, which is in the prime factorization of n, i.e. n is equal to something else, which I'll call m here, times p. n is a multiple of p, or, ra or you could also say p divides n. Okay, p is a divisor of m, but we'll just say n is a multiple of p like so. There is something, some m here, which is some other natural number, that's all the rest of the prime factorization here, uh, times p will equal m here. So n is a multiple of p, we're saying. Okay, and this is a prime natural number here. Okay, so Cauchy's theorem is then that if you've got some prime here such that your order of the group is a multiple of this prime, i.e. in the prime factorization for the order of the group, this prime appears there, then you can always conclude that there will exist an element in the group which has that order. So I'll put this here. So there exists an element, which we'll call little g, which is not the identity element. So it is not the identity element, so it's in the set that is the group without the identity element, which I'm in this video denoting by E here. Okay, so there exists some little g, which is an element of the group and is not the, uh, at the identity element, um, which if you raise it to the power of p, so if you take g to the power of p, by which of course I mean g composed with itself, composed with itself again, and overall composed with itself p times, so compose g with itself p times, you get the identity. Okay, and of course this means that the order of this element is going to be equal to the uh, prime p, um, because that must now be the smallest number of times uh, that you can compose g with itself to get the identity. And remember the definition of the order of an element, okay, written like so, the order of an element of the group is the smallest number of times you can compose it with itself to get the identity back. And of course, if we're saying that I can raise g to the power of p and get the identity, well, that must mean p is the uh, order of that group, uh, sorry, not the order of the group, the order of the group element, because you can't, uh, it can't be the case that there is a smaller power of g which would give the identity, because if it was the case, then that p would have to be a multiple of that smaller uh, natural number. And of course, a prime number is only a multiple of one in itself. Okay, so uh, 
in this, it was the case that g to the power of 1 equaled the identity, which would only be the case if it was actually equal to the identity itself, uh, and we said that g was not the identity, uh, then there is no option. Okay, there is no smaller power of g that you can have which will give you the identity in this case. So that p must be the smallest power of g that you can take which will give you the identity and therefore by definition it's the order of that element of the group. So this is what Cauchy's theorem says. It says that you give me any finite group which when I look at this order of this finite group it has some prime p in its prime factorization, i.e. it's a multiple of this prime p, you can always conclude that there will be some element in that group, which we're calling g here, such that g has p as its order. And of course what you can then do is create the cyclic subgroup generated by g, which will be uh, the subset of the group capital G, which contains the identity g to the power of 1, g to the power of 2, etc., all the way up to g to the power of p minus 1, and then, of course, when you go above that, you'll just revert back to the identity. And this will be a cyclic subgroup of order p, i.e. it will be isomorphic to the cyclic group of p elements, Okay, and this will be a subgroup inside the group capital G. So you can always conclude, therefore, that there will be a subgroup inside the group capital G, which will be a cyclic subgroup, uh, which will have order P. Okay, so this tells us about the existence of these beautiful cyclic subgroups inside any order, uh, sorry, any finite group uh, whose order is a multiple of a prime P. So look for the primes in the prime factorization of the order of a group. You can always conclude that there are going to be cyclic subgroups of order any of the primes that appear in that prime factorization. Okay, that is what Cauchy's theorem says. So there's the statement of Cauchy's theorem. Now what we're of course going to do is prove that this is true. Okay, so let's begin with the proof. And the proof is going to use group actions. Okay, so firstly, let's concoct the set that we're going to actually be acting on in order to prove this, and then we'll actually see the action. So firstly, let's concoct the set. So the set that the group action is going to be working on, I will call this capital S here. Okay, and this is going to be the set containing some rather strange things, and initially, if you've never seen this argument before, you might wonder, well, why on earth are you defining that? But you will see how this argument all uh, wraps up. It's not a too long argument, so it's not an argument where you'll be struggling to forget, the, sorry, struggling to remember, not forget, the beginning by the time you've got to the end. It is a short argument, uh, but initially when I define this set you will be like, well, why on earth would you want to look at that? Uh, but it does work, okay, and you will understand, so bear with this argument, it doesn't take too long. Okay, so we've got this set, capital S, okay, and what is this set going to be defined as? Well, it's going to be defined to be equal to the set that contains all the p-tuples of elements from the group, and I'll just draw a picture of exactly what I mean. So these structures which are going to be um, p-tuples of elements of the group, so you'll have an element of the group here, a1, a2, all the way along to a p element of the group here, Okay, and of course you've separated them by little commas and put brackets around them like coordinates. Okay, so this is what's known as a p-tuple, okay, because you've got p-lots of elements of the group. So it's a p-tuple of uh, AI, which are elements of the group. So p-tuple of elements of the group here. So you look at all p-tuples of elements of the group such that they obey an interesting criterion. Okay, so the interesting criterion that these p-tuples must obey is that if you compose together all of the entries in the p-tuple, so you compose a1 with a2, and you go all the way up to, whoops, where, what am I doing, uh, a, let's uh, all fix that, a to uh, p minus 1 here, all the way up to a p, Okay, you compose them all together, and of course I'm just writing the elements next to each other, but that means compose the elements together. So you compose them together in this nice order here, you must get the identity. Okay, uh, oh, and I should stress, Cauchy's theorem doesn't need us to be working in a commutative group, it just requires the group to be finite. Okay, so it is important that you have these multiplied in this certain order, okay, because we haven't specified that we're working in a commutative group, so you must specify the order when we're 
talking about compositions. Okay, so uh, we've got A1 composed of A2 all the way up to composed of AP, so compose all of these together. Of course, I don't need to worry about where the brackets are because we know we're working in a group, so associativity holds true, so I don't need to faff around with brackets. Okay, you can put the brackets in if you like, however you choose to do that, the answer will be the same. That's what associativity tells me, so I'm not going to bother. Okay, so I'm insisting that when you compose all of the L entries in this P t in these p-tuples that are going to be in this set together, you must get the identity. Okay, well, you can certainly define this. You can't stop me defining this. You might not understand why I would want to define this yet, but you will. Okay, so what we're going to ask now, the next question, is going to be how many elements are there actually in this set? What's the size of this set? Okay, clearly because the group is finite, there are only going to be a finite number of these. Uh, it's bounded by the total maximum number of p-tuples of elements of the group you could possibly concoct. Okay, um, but what is going to actually be the size here? Because it's not going to be the same as the size of all p-tuples of elements of the group, because we've restricted it down to having to obey this criterion here. But this criterion is not as difficult as it looks, because actually you can let a1, a2, all the way up to a p minus 1 equal whichever elements of the group you like, provided you then pick a p very carefully. Okay, provided you make a p equal to the inverse of a p minus 1, so a p minus 1 inverse, and then you multiply this with the inverse of a2, a2 inverse, and a1 inverse. So you go through all of these, find their inverse elements, and then put them in the opposite order here. Can you see that if I was to substitute that in for ap here, then everything would start cancelling. ap minus 1 would cancel with its inverse here, they'd go. ap minus 2 would cancel with its inverse, which would be after ap minus 1's inverse, etc. And you'd go all the way down to a2 cancelling with a2's inverse, and a1 cancelling with a1's inverse, and you'd get the identity. So actually, you are totally free to let a1, a2, all the way up to a p minus 1 equal whatever you like, whatever takes your fancy from the group capital G, okay, provided that you pick a p in this way. a p is then set after that. You can't change a p. There's only one element of the group that can go there in order for this statement to be true. Okay, so how big then is this set here? Well, it's just going to be how many different uh, combinations can you come up with for the first p minus 1 sockets here? And of course, there are n things in the groups. So you can put n things in a1's position, you can put n things in a2's position, all the way up to p minus 1's position. So overall, the number of different things in here is going to be n to the power of p minus 1. Okay, now the key thing to note about that is that this is going to be a multiple of p, because n is a multiple of p, so you're multiplying a multiple of p lots of times together, and of course the thing that you overall get is going to still be a multiple of p. This is going to be, if you like, I could substitute in m times p here for n, and then we'd have this to the power of p minus 1, and evidently what you're going to get is going to be m to the power of p minus 1 times p to the power of p minus 1. Okay, so you're going to have something that's a multiple of p, absolutely. Okay, so the size of this set, the important thing to take from this is that it is a multiple of p. That's the important bit that's going to come into play later on in the proof of Cauchy's theorem. Okay, so where are we going to go from here? This is the set on which I'm going to define a clever group action. But firstly, what I want to point out to you is that if you have one element in this set, so let's say we have a1, a2, all the way up to AP, and we're now imagining that these are fixed. I've chosen some A1, some A2, all the way up to some AP here, so I've picked an element from this set S. What I want to show you is that if you cycle these around, the p-tuple that you end up with is still going to be in here. So my claim is that I can bring AP right to the front here, and then move everything along by 1, cycle everything along by 1, move everything along by 1 to the right here. Okay, and what I'll get is the p-tuple that looks like this, a p, a 1, a 2, all the way up to a p minus 1, and from this you might be starting to guess uh, which group I'm going to have acting on this set, but we'll 
leave that till later. At the moment, all I want to claim is that this other p-tuple, which is certainly another p-tuple of the elements of the group, is also going to be an s. So if this is an element of s, I claim that this one is also going to be an element of s. Now that requires proof, okay, because um, how do we know that it still obeys this condition? Because we're not necessarily working in a commutative group. Okay, so I can't just multi, you know, I can't just uh, or alter the order in this way and hope that it will be true. I have to have a good justification for why that's going to be true. What I know from the fact that this one's in S is that A1 composed of A2 all the way down to composed of AP is equal to the identity. But think what I can now do. I can multiply both sides on the right by the inverse of AP. Okay, so I can get A1, A2 all the way to down to AP minus 1 is equal to AP's inverse. But now compose both sides on the left this time with AP. Okay, and what will you get? You'll get AP composed of A1 composed of A2 all the way down to AP inverse is equal to the identity. Okay, do you see what I've done there? It's all because the thing on the right hand side is the identity okay so when whatever you multiply by that you just get the other thing back again and this allows you to basically move things from being here if you like to being over here and it doesn't matter it doesn't change it this is what i've shown you here okay but now if this is true i can do it again i can move this thing around here and it will be true again so what i could imagine doing is moving these along again so i could create the p tuple like so ap minus one ap a1, A2, and it will go all the way up to AP minus 2 now, and that would still be an element of S because of the same argument that the statement that needs to be true would still be true because of the fact that I can alter them round in this way, in the way that I've just shown you. Okay, so how can we summarize this then? If you've got one p-tuple here, which is an element of the set capital S, then all of these cyclic permutations of that, where you've moved everything along by a certain cycle, you've moved everything along to the right by a certain amount, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, all the way up to p minus 1, those p-tuples, those p different p-tuples that are all associated by these cycle uh, permutations, they are all going to be in this set capital S. Okay, so that's the first thing to point out. We will have a break here, and in the next video what we will do is we will now define the group action that we're going to have on this set. And the group action is going to be a group action by the cyclic group of P elements on this set capital S, and it's going to just move elements of the group around, uh, oh, sorry, elements of the set around in this way. Okay, so it's going to move, it's, when, when an element of the cyclic group are on P elements uh, acts on one of these elements, it will just move the things along by the amount that that uh, cyclic, um, that element of the cyclic group corresponds to moving things along by. Okay, but we'll see that in the next video.